dummies as Rodeo wanted me to, but that's <laughs> kind of, kind of hopefully that's what we're trying to make it out to be. Okay? We're going to give you a world-worn tour of reading how many function tests here today. I have no disclosures. Nobody wants it. Okay. How many function testing for you? How many new fellows here today? One. Two. You're not new. Put your hand down. I said new fellows. <laughs> you don't count. Okay. Only two? Rats. So this is kind of maybe. A lot of this is geared for the new guys because you guys know this stuff already. At least hopefully you do. You rotated with me. If you've forgotten, shame on you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, basically, everything you need to know about this lecture here. Uh, on the Jennings, the HFH Palm site, as you've got most of you guys know, if you click on the PFP uh, button over there, there's a bunch of little tabs up here. All the articles on the PFPs, exercise, six minute walk, every reference you have to know is there. Where we've got our predicted values uh, under the PFPs we're going to talk about today. The very first one is called confidence intervals for PFPs. I don't expect you to memorize the confidence intervals on PFPs, but I expect you to have a pretty good idea where they lie. And we're going to go over some of that today. I want you to have ballpark figures to know if something looks reasonable in a test or not. Uh, the instructions to get the patients to perform those. Uh, the guidelines on all these tabs are the guidelines for these various tests. This is something really hopefully you'll read before you graduate. Uh, everything, you know, a lot of you guys like to go out and buy these textbooks on pulmonary function testing with 280 pages by some guru. Guidelines, five guidelines, each of them about five pages long. You read those, you know everything you need to know and all that other stuff in that book is just kind of BS, okay? Uh, some guy's opinion. The guidelines tell you what you really need to know. Now, three complementary tests we're going to kind of take a world one tour through today, okay? Number one, spirometry. These are not new tests. Spirometry was invented in 1846 by a guy named Hutchinson. It's been around for like, what, 160, 70 years now. The only thing we're doing different now is we just have all these little computers and nice whistles and buttons and lights to go off to make it look like we're doing something really kind of neat. Uh, but really, the old days, they'd take an old bucket, turn it upside down, the old water seal spirometer. The results were just as accurate or more accurate than what we're doing today with flow volume sensors and things like that. It's been around forever. The fusing capacity, invented by a guy named Crow in 1910. Actually, I gave a lecture on this a couple years ago. He actually stole the idea from his wife, Berta, who was a medical student at the time, but he got the Nobel Prize. Uh, gas volumes, first invented in 1800 by a guy named Davy, uh, came into clinical use by a guy named Darling in 1940. Nothing new here either. We're talking about, what, 70 years of uh, nitrogen lung volumes. For those who cannot do plethysmography, okay, this is for those who cannot do plethysmography. Plethysmography arguably might be a little more accurate. That was actually invented in 1956. So that's been around a long time also. The advantage of plethysmography over gas volumes we're going to talk about as we go through is that this measures the trap gas. Uh, but it's a lot more difficult to measure than nitrogen. Um, <coughs> we're not going to talk about resistance, conductance, specific conductance. That's yeah, a little more complicated. We'll do that kind of when we get to your rotations. Okay, now, interpretation. That's kind of why we're here today. Spirometry volumes of diffusion. We always use 95% confidence intervals. Okay? In order to do that for these various values, whatever it is, TLC, FEV1, FVC, can you, can you push that door around a little bit for me, Guido? Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, all these regression equations are adjusted for age, height, sex, and race. Now, because it's gotten so complex, they have many variables in these, you know, all these factors together. Confidence intervals are using moving targets for various values. I can't expect you to memorize them, but hey, we got computers now. So I make it easier for you guys. If it appears in red with parentheses around it, it's outside the 95% confidence limit of normal, okay? It's in black, it's normal, it's in red, it's not. Real easy. It's amazing sometimes after it's in red, I have a fellow ask me it's in black. Well, geez, this really looks like abnormal to me. What do you think, you know? It's, uh, we'll talk about some of those weird situations. Though. Okay, in order to be able to use the regression equations, though, the one thing we always tend to forget, make sure <coughs> the patient's demographic information is correct. You know, if you see a, a you know a little old lady, 80 years old, whatever, she's got an FVC that's 210 percent of predicted. Make sure you go back and check to make sure that that patient's not really 72 inches tall instead of 62 inches tall. First thing you look at demographics, make sure they make sense because remember they're 95 percent confidence intervals. If somebody's like 18 standard deviations beyond the upper limit of normal, look to make sure that that really is the right patient information. It's not something pun. The techs, they're human. We do over 8,000 patient tests a year. It's easy to punch in the wrong number, you know, to put the wrong height, the wrong weight, that kind of thing. Okay. 
So, sample test. What's in red is abnormal. What's in black falls within the confidence of the normal. What we're going to talk about in a minute, though, notice we also list the percent predicted. Keep in mind, percent predicted is in red. It doesn't mean that that value is what we're measuring. We're going to use the percent predicted as a way to quantitate when something is abnormal. So, for example, what do we not want to do? What is the point of base so far? What we do not want to do. Since 1991, there's been several guidelines. I go back as far as 1991. They all state we should not determine if someone is abnormal by using a percent predicted or an absolute cutoff that define them to normal. And I put gold there, which we're going to talk about. Once you establish it is abnormal based on a confidence limit, then we use the percent predicted to quantify how impaired that really is. Keep in mind, we're going to talk about gold in just a second here. It's, it's a statement. Don't use the word guideline because it's not a guideline. They clearly state in our first paragraph we are not a guideline. We are a statement. Okay. It's to tool to classify and manage COPD. They state that. It's not meant to be an interpretive scheme for every disease in the world, which somehow that's kind of what it's morphed into over the years. Okay. Just to point out really quickly, what is wrong with gold? This is going to be a board question, by the way. It's been on the boards every year for like the last four or five years now. Which means you guys can attest to the take it. Gold tells you that the FEV1 to FEC ratio, no matter what you for your age, from 20 up to 100, gold says if you fall that absolute ratio below 70%, not 70% are predicted, if the absolute number is below 70%, that person's FEV1 to FEC ratio is less than 70%, <laughs> they have COPD. Everybody below you. The reality of the situation is this red line using our NHANES predicted values database of 40,000 patients. NHANES states that from the, okay, that your confidence, or I'm sorry, your predicted value when you're 20 starts around 84% and it progressively declines as you age. The lower limit of normal Caucasian's about 9.5%, uh, Black's it's around 10.5%, but the lower limit of normal follows it, parallels it downward, okay? So in other words, notice by the time you reach the age of just a little over 40, your lower limit of normal is below 70%. So in other words, if you're using gold, any button that falls, patients that fall into this category, in other words, they're above 70%, but they're below this confidence of the normal. These are patients that are abnormal, that gold is calling normal. If they're above 40 and they're below 70%, but above this dotted line, these are the patients that are still normal, that gold is saying have COPD. So what's this uh, amount to in real world terms? Okay. 50% of the patients of abnormal younger adults, those are less than under 40, 50% of the abnormal younger adults are reported as normal. You're miscalling half the asthmatics stating they're normal if you use gold. Kind of makes sense because most asthmatics, they're not like our COPD, COPD patients are like the anaerobes with FEV ones of a half liter. These are guys that have just a little bit of obstruction, they're really wheezy and uncomfortable. So they're above that 70% point, but they're still abnormal. So if you use gold to try to diagnose asthma, you're missing 50% of the asthmatics by doing that. That's half of them. Okay. Now, 20% of normal older adults are said to have COPD when they're actually normal. Now, let me go back. That 20% actually depends on what kind of your age, your patient population. That 20% falls in this category. Looking at our data, when our patients are more like out here in the 75 to 90 range, a lot of them, we're kind of talking up to almost half of them now also are being misclassified. Okay? So the older you get, the more you're calling normal people COPD. Okay. <clears throat> Keep in mind that the, the take home lesson, gold is a good tool for helping to manage and classify to manage COPD. It's not meant to interpret all diseases in the world and unfortunately it's kind of turned into that now. <clears throat> okay, same holds true for other measurements like the FBC. We talked about the FEV and the FBC ratio, but the FBC, I've got a couple of examples. This is a male, this is a black female, white male, black female. Now, in a white male, notice that here, Okay, this is the force vital capacity. We're going to show the lower limit of normal in red here as a percent predicted. In other words, the lower confidence limit is kind of narrow here. 
about 83% of predictive. But as the patient gets older, 20 up to 100, the lower the confidence limits get wider and wider. So the lower limit of normal out here, and get to around 80 or so, is around you know 72, 73% of predicted. Okay, it's a moving target. But again, notice this gray zone here. These are patients that are uh, abnormal. If you're using some people like that 80% cutoff of FEC. A lot of times you guys come from training programs, the doctor looks, oh, this is less than 80%, that patient's restricted. Okay, well this shows you why. The only time that rule holds, if a patient's at a one point in time, this exact same point here. Out here, uh, if they're less than this, they're gonna be abnormal, but if you use the 80% cutoff, you're gonna be wrong. And the same thing happens in the older age groups, that again, these are normal patients out here that are gonna be called restricted if you're using an absolute 80% cutoff. Where it really gets kind of ugly is in black females. Because notice here, they start off with their lower limit of normal below 80%. When they're 20 years of age, <coughs> 73, 74%, I'm sorry, 78 or 79% is the lower limit of normal, and it keeps falling. So all these patients in here are still normal, but if you use that 80% cutoff in the black population, you're going to be way off base. And that's why we use confidence intervals. Okay. Now let's talk about spirometry a little bit. Okay, on days you read with Dr. Qualley, he loves the flow volume loops, so we'll talk about them first. Normal flow volume loop, patient now takes a deep breath, flows out real hard, comes down really kind of a straight line, inspiratory flow here, patient has COPD, we're all pretty much familiar with these, we see lots of scalloping in here we call that because they have air trapping, the airways are collapsing, they can't get the air out as fast, okay? Kind of basic stuff here so far. Go back here again. Um, I'm a big lover of the volume time curves, as you all know. I think you can get as much or even more information off of them. You know, for example, here's a patient here that's normal. The volume time curve, times in seconds across here, volume is in liters here. The patient, can, you can see here as he starts to blow out really hard, he gets almost all of his air out in the first second or two of blowing, okay? A normal patient should achieve zero flow out here around four to five seconds in that area. And zero flow means he just he's emptied his lungs. Even though you can empty your lungs completely, patients that are trained and do a good job, you can still keep that pressure against a closed valve. I mean, I've got normal lungs. I can make my line go here, go here, and go here. I can do that for 30 seconds, just because I've done it a lot of years, kind of calibrating machines and stuff. So it is possible to do that. Um, patients that have COPD, what their tracing looks like, what takes the place of that scalloping is kind of the inverse of that here. There's a slow upslope. They're kind of squeezing air out. They don't rise up sharp to get it all out right away. It takes longer time to get it out. It goes out eight seconds. The line comes back because we run out of paper. So we have to go back for another eight seconds, run out of paper again. We go back for another two or three seconds over here. Um, this signifies air trapping. The more, more separation between these lines, the more air trapping there is, the patient's still got a lot of air he can squeeze out. Okay, when you pick, give a patient a bronchodilator, bronchodilator, <coughs> the pre-flows we show in blue, bronchodilators we show up in red. And you see there's some separation between here. Now this is the same patient here. Really hard to judge, gosh, is this really a significant improvement? But if you look at the volume time curves in red, you can see all the way out. There's some big separation between these now, okay? You can actually see the difference between, and this is actually about, about 13 to 15% improvement in this patient here. And you see that with separation between the lines. Patient with restriction, they kind of rise really quickly. You see, they have low volumes because they're really restricted. So they're not going to kind of shoot way up like so and come across. They're going to kind of shoot up a little bit, but they had zero flow pretty quickly. All that increased elastic recoil, this guy gets most of his air out in the first second or so, and after that, he keeps doing a good job, keeping his mouth pressure against the closed valve with no air, and it just stays flat. This flow volume loop, which you see here, really squished together. The reason it's squished together is because on the x-axis is liters. If you don't have a big volume, just a, you know, a, a liter and a half or so, that guy's going to be squeezed together pretty tight there. You'll see a nice little peak there from elastic recoil because he's so stiff. Uh, so you can tell a lot by just looking at the tracings. And I agree with, uh, with, with Dr. Paul, who would always try to you know, hammer in your guys' heads reading. Look at the tracings. Look at the tracings, okay? Because they can give you a lot of information what's going on with that patient. Okay, uh, just to hit on this for a minute, uh, fixed airway obstruction. There's certain characteristic patterns. I wish this test was more useful than it really is because the question always comes up, well, how bad do you have to be before you see that expiratory flattening and the inspiratory flattening? 
And when you think about in a grown man, the average trachea diameter is probably around maybe 25 to 30 millimeters. You have to get down less than 10 millimeters diameter before you actually start seeing an effective flow volume loose. It's got to be pretty dramatic. They got to be pretty tight before you actually see that happen. Okay. So the characteristic pattern for what we call the variable intrathoracic obstruction. Variable means it kind of flops around. Let's say you got a big old polypoid lesion in your trachea. On expiration, what will happen is they hit all that elastic recoil is letting go in the lung. The trachea is kind of collapsing down a little bit as releasing that tension on it, so you're blowing out hard, and so it flattens the expiratory. But on inspiration, the reason I call it variable is because trachea does stretch a little bit, the big airways stretch a little bit, opening up, so it just takes a very little couple millimeters change and then this inspiratory loop appears normal. When you call it variable extrathoracic, it's kind of up in the neck area. What's happening here? Anybody have a blank piece? Oh, here, i got a piece of paper here. I love this principle. If you guys remember Bernoulli's principle from high school physics? Remember what Bernoulli's principle is? That's why airplanes fly. That's why baseballs curve, that kind of thing. But Bernoulli's principle tells you that in areas of higher velocity airflow, you have lower pressure. So pretend this is an airplane wheel. The air, because it's curved on top, takes longer to go over the, or it has to go over the top faster to get to the end point than the flat bottom. So if I'm going to, I'm pretending I'm the, the you know, airplane coming my way, I'm the wind, creating the velocity. See how it lifts when I do that, creating lift. That's Bernoulli's principle. Well, that's what happens here in airway. It's also why a curveball curves, but we'll talk about that another time when we have our little rotation. I'll we'll to give that story. Okay, now, the reason you see this when you have a neck lesion, that's more soft and flexible up here, okay? Um, what will happen is, is you blow out really hard. You're actually kind of hitting down a structure, you're dilating it a little bit. As you blow out, this gets structure dilates, so the air gets around easier. That's why the expiratory looks normal here. Inspiration, though, when you're sucking it fast, you're creating a higher velocity in soft tissues so are collapsing down. As you create that high velocity sucking in, that negative pressure makes that variable lesion kind of close off even more, sucks the soft tissue around it. Okay, so enough of that. Okay, as we already alluded to, normal spirogram. Let's get into some actual tests now that kind of get into the nitty gritty here. Normal spirogram. As I said, all values are in black, not red with parentheses. So here's a patient here, only in black. No brainer, this guy's normal. A couple points I wanted to make about this though. Notice that this guy's reference value predicted is 70. We know the lower limit of normal for a Caucasian is about 9.5, 9.5 to 9.6. So in other words, this guy's lower limit of normal is 60. This guy's 65, so he's clearly within that 10% range of normal. Yet if we were using gold, this guy would be called COPD. Okay? But this is normal for an 89-year-old. When I said I don't expect you to memorize confidence intervals, I don't expect you to memorize it, but I expect you to know the general area they're in. To know like Caucasians for F going to FPC ratio, the most important number we use for obstruction defining it. Know that in whites it's around nine and a half. Know that in blacks it's around ten and a half. Okay? That way, some, for some reason the computer doesn't identify in red, somebody flipped off the switch, which sometimes happens. You, know, you can actually look at the number and know if you're in the ballpark. Okay. Now, let's do the actual interpreting now. When you interpret a spirogram, you always look for obstruction first, then restriction. How we define obstruction is always with ratios. The most important ratio is the FEV1 to FEC. If it's a pre-bronchodilator that's reduced or post-bronchodilator, we call obstruction. That patient is obstructed. If this number is normal in black, then through order of precedence, we fall down to other values. We look at the FEV1 to SVC that we're going to talk about, controversial. We'll look at the, uh, after that, we look at the FEV1 to FEV6. If that's normal, then it goes up and looks at the FEV3 to FEC. We're going to talk about each one of these individually, okay? But that's how the computer program falls through it. If this one's abnormal, you need go no further. If it's abnormal, it's reduced. You can skip all the other numbers. If this one's normal, you start falling through the algorithm looking at the other ones. Okay, now, once you identify obstruction, you then use the FEV1 as a percent predictor to tell how bad the obstruction is. Okay, and that uh, on, online there at the HFH pump site, these uh, numbers are actually in there. And it tells you that the patient actually, if, now here's kind of the downfall of these ratios. 
we have really good predicted values for the FE1 to FEC for whites, for blacks, for Hispanics. What the guidelines tell us to do, we have no regression equations for the FE1 to SVC or post dilator on that, but we use the same predicted values. You know, I could maybe buy that for the dilator one, but I have a little trouble with this one because the SVC maneuver is not part of spirometry. It's part of the lung volume measurements that we're going to talk about in a little bit, okay? So to take a test that's done as part of plethysmography and then take that number and throw it into your spirogram, assuming that the SVC should always be the same as the FVC, yeah, it's probably going to work a good part of the time, but that's a pretty big assumption. There was guys on the 2005 Guidelines Committee from the United States that actually, you know, they got together with the ERS for the first time, let's have a combined statement worldwide, all be good boys and work together, play in the same sandbox. Uh, that got to be a real problem, though, because it was supposed to be evidence-based. And there's no evidence-based for doing that. There's been a little bit since then, but uh, basically um, they're making assumptions. Guys quit the committee because of that. They said, show me the evidence. It couldn't. Europeans demanded this had to be kept in there because this is what they do. And some guys walked out of the committee and said, you guys are on your own. But essentially, though, if your FEV1 is mild obstruction is all the way down to an FEV1 of 70% of predicted. Just keep in mind that anything above 70% of predicted is going to be mild obstruction. If the FEV1 is normal, it's going to be mild obstruction. If the FEV1 is below the confidence limit of normal, see how complicated it is to find that confidence interval of the FEV1, the height of centimeters squared times 2.213 times 10 to the minus 5. You know, I want to see you do that with your calculator every day, up 30 tests, huh? Um, Okay, but basically, you know, if it's, even if it's below the confidence interval, if it's above it or below it, as long as it's above 70%, the FEV1, we call it mild obstruction. Are you simple enough so far? Yeah, good. Yeah. All right, good. Let me know. If you guys have any questions along the way, stick your hand up. Stop me. I, I do talk very fast. Got a lot of slides to get in as well. Okay, now, let's do some examples. Here's a patient here. Spirogram shows the FEV1 to FEC as ratio is reduced. Remember, we always look for obstruction first before we look at FVC or anything else. So this is a guy who's clearly built a confidence of the normal. It's in red, it's parentheses, bottom limit of normal for a white uh, patient here, female, be about 9.6 or so. Uh, so down to about 65 and a half or so is going to be considered within the confidence of the normal. Clearly reduced below that at 58. Because the FEV1 is normal, it's in black, but let's say it wasn't in black, let's say it's at, uh, Okay, well, let me kind of backtrack a little bit. If the FEV1 is normal, which it is here, or even if the FEV1 is less than the lower limit of normal, let's say it could show up in, uh, uh, well, actually, yes, it can show up in red here, but still be above 70% of predicted, we're still going to call it mild obstruction. So mild covers a long, long range. Go to the next step, patient's a little sicker here, okay. Here we have, again, the FEV1 and the FEC ratio is reduced. But unlike the previous patient, now the FEV1 here is now in red. It's below the confidence of the normal. So uh, because this is 64% of predicted, it's below that 70% cutoff, but greater than 60. So this guy falls into the moderate category. Patient gets a little bit sicker now. Again, ratios abnormal. Because this is abnormal, it's reduced. We don't have to look at any of the other ratios because they're all low anyway. This time, the FEV1 is 46% of predicted. So now that we're below 50%, but greater than 35, we call this severe. Now, keep in mind also, it's below 35, by the way, we call it very severe. These are arbitrary cutoffs. There's no confidence limits. There's statistical things that said this mild, moderate, moderate, severe, whatever. I think a lot of this is just kind of, you know, ridiculous, quite honestly. You have that many categories. Uh, but part of the guidelines, because they're meant for everybody, I would be happy to say this test is normal, this test is abnormal, this patient really, it's really stinks, it's that bad. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, the, you don't want to help the doctors that are ordering these to kind of quantitate how severe they are. We actually used to have a, just a few basic categories a number of years ago, but then we're getting a lot of phone calls and the guidelines realize this, you know, family doctors, nurse practitioners, well, give me an idea how bad this really is. It just says it's abnormal. So that's kind of why they have those arbitrary cutoffs in there, but they are arbitrary, keep that in mind. Again, look at the full volume loops, lots of scalloping on this. Okay, now, another situation. Okay, here's a patient now that the FEV and the FEC ratio is normal. FEC is normal, it's in black at 78%. FEV1 is still normal. Notice these values well below 80%, but they're still within the confidence of the normal. But this patient clearly has obstruction. We'll talk about why here in a minute. But because the FEV1 to FEV6 ratio 
is reduced and the FP1 is normal, we call this mild obstruction. Keep in mind, look at this number we can get back to, the expiratory time of 8.66 seconds. Okay, well, what's the rationale? Why do we use the FEV1 to FEV6? There's some centers that that's the only number they use. They use this instead of the FEC, FEV1 to FEC. There's other centers that ignore it completely. Well, the National Lung Health uh, uh, Education Program, back in 2000, advocated that this number could be used as a surrogate for the FEV1 to FEC. The reason for that is because it requires less effort. You only have to go sick. It's less variable than the FEC. You know, the FEC is the most variable number on, on spirometry. Patient, all you have to do is blow six seconds. It's called a good test. A patient with COPD can blow for 30 seconds. There's everything in between. Well, the FEV6 is a consistent endpoint. Let's, you know, the NHANES data, they said, well, let's look at all the patients, what that FEV6, FEV6 ratio looks like, what the confidence intervals look like. Well, it was kind of interesting because the confidence limits are smaller. Eight, remember I said for, for other, uh, uh, for the FEV1 to FEV, FEV uh, I'm sorry, the FEV1 to FEC, that's 9.5 to 10.5. This is like 10% lower, the confidence intervals, because of that more consistent endpoint. So then you say, why don't we just use that instead? Okay, well, I was kind of fascinated by this because I had this theory that maybe it's not really a surrogate, maybe it doesn't mean the same thing, but maybe it's additional information. Maybe this is just something we ought to look at in addition to the FEV1 to FEC to see if it's helpful. Well, what we found was that if we ignored the FEV1 to FEC, when this number was clearly obstructed, the gold standard of obstruction is that ratio being low, we found that 14% of our COPD, our obstructed patients, had a normal FEV1 to FEV6. Wow, so if we just used that number, I'm sorry, uh, da, 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 uh, if we just use this number alone, we're missing 14% of the obstructed patients. The converse of the situation is, well, in 4% of our COPD patients, that's the only number that's abnormal. Then I said, well, what, why do we see that? Why is this popping up? So we studied that population. Now, we have a database of 100,000 people, so we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these people where the FEV1 to FEV6 is the only number that's low. And we found out that those patients had a shorter expiratory time, around eight seconds. Let me see if I have on the next slide. No, no. No, I didn't include that data, I probably should have. But what we found was this group of patients that had complete pulmonary function tests, when this was the only abnormality, these patients, compared to normals, all had, with p-values less than 0 .0001, they had higher TLCs, they had hyperinflation, they had diffusion impairment. So really what's going on is, this group of patients here are really COPD patients, when this is the only abnormality, that didn't blow long enough in their spirometry. Okay, in other words, they quit at six, five, six, seven seconds, so they could have blown a lot longer. As a result of that, the FEV1 to FEC ratio was still normal, because they still had a lot of trapped gas in there. So this is actually a sicker population group. Their COPD is a lot more hyperinflation. Almost invariably, when you see this, when I read test a lot of you guys, we see this, first thing I look at is the expiratory time, and said, aha, it's like, you know, eight seconds. So we found that if we took that group of patients where this is the FEV1 to FEV6 is the only abnormality, and we looked at repeat spirograms. Almost all these patients, their FEV1 to FEC ratio was right at the lower limit of normal. It was almost abnormal, but still in a normal range. If they blew like one and a half seconds longer, they all shifted into this category with a reduced FEV1 to FEC. They all became clearly obstructed by our gold standard method. So I'm uh, claiming, which we published here a while back with some fellows, Dr. Hulu was one up on their paper there, the patients where this is the only abnormality that's a nice adjunct to spirometry because if they have a shorter expiratory time, you're going to pick up those COPD years easier because of those tight confidence intervals. Okay, here's another patient. This is a patient here with the FEV3 to FEC is the only number that's abnormal. This is my favorite number, okay? Well, the confidence limits, again, we went through all our database of so this, went to the end range data and stuff, and kind of interesting, if you look at the FEV3 to FEC ratio, Look at the confidence intervals here. They're like half what they are for the FEV1 to FEC. They're like five. Some of them, for some reasons, Hispanics, they're 4.7. Really very tight, those confidence intervals. It's been validated that this number is consistent for obstruction because where you see it, it's been identified as being a first abnormality in smokers in the past. 
that's been revalidated, not just in the NHANES data, but a number of authors have supported this over the years. Crapo, Hankinson, Wasserman, I mean, these are some of the big heavy hitters in the field of primitive function testing. These are all my heroes, actually. Fortunately, half of them are, two thirds of them are dead now. Uh, for the old I am. Okay, one of them's almost there. Okay, so we looked at this also. We took our database, 100,000 patients. We tried to find, we pulled out all the patients, that was the only abnormality, the FEV3, FEC ratio. I wanted to find out if there's some kind of pathologic finding we can find. In other words, is there something on complete point function test that identifies this being reduced as true pathology? This is really, really abnormal, okay? Well, we found that when we compared this group that this is the only abnormality, against all the normal pulmonary function tests. I mean, we're talking about tens of thousands, okay? We found, it's great when you have that many numbers, that many patients in it, because every p-value you do is like .001, like off, you know, like triple zeros in there off the wall type stuff. Uh, and the patient population that big, but it did correlate with past smoking when this is the only abnormality. We saw more in, in, uh, in whites than we did it in, uh, in other races. Uh, this patient, this group compared to normals, they had higher TLCs which is a pathological sign of hyperinflation. They had higher residual volumes, another pathological clue of hyperinflation. They had higher RVTLC ratios, a sign of air trapping. They had lower specific inductance, a sign of airways obstruction. And they had lower diffusions, which is a sign of loss of the air, uh, gas exchange surface of the lung. Okay. Now we found, here's what's really interesting. If we ignored this number, we're gonna be missing 16% of our obstructed patients. Most people don't use this number. Actually, since we published this in chess, back a few years ago. Question, or are you just stretching? No, no, I have a question. Go ahead. So, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand why with, so the FBC, so the denominator is the same, right? Right. So why, theoretically, an FBV3 should be larger than an FBV1. It is, much larger. Right. So why why would an FBV3 over FBC be, um, show a lower number when compared to an FBV1 over FBC? I'm glad you asked that, that question, okay. Because we're measuring further out in the volume time curve now, out of three seconds, not at one second, the presumption is this is more of a reflection of mid-flow obstruction. Remember when you measure the FEV1, you're measuring the large airways only, trachea, bronchi, major bronchi. Pretty much that's, that's what you're measuring at that point. Okay, when you get out this far, you're measuring just further out in the airway. Now notice I'm not using the term small airways obstruction. Get away from that term. There's no way we really have a measuring small airways, whatever that means. All we can say is because this is out in the mid-flow area of the volume time curves, it seems to be picking up more patients because it kind of makes sense pathologically also. Patients that are smokers, the injury is going to occur more peripherally than it is central. It kind of works its way peripherally forward. I'm oh, sorry, peripherally proximal. As you smoke more, get those little destruction of the small airways that collapse down, lose their elasticity, get some air trapping. So it starts more out in the periphery than it works its way more proximal. So this kind of number kind of makes sense. Actually, this first occurred at Crapo back in the 1970s. The real heavy hitters in pulmonary function testing are out on the West Coast. Salt Lake City, Oregon, Washington, uh, San Diego. They've been using this number routinely for like 30, before the guidelines came out. Uh, before the ATS guidelines, that was called the Snowbird Society. That was like the forerunner. ATS back then was just the TB organization. Uh, it wasn't like for all lung diseases like it is now. These guys are the ones that really set the standards of pulmonary function testing, the original guidelines. Eventually though, the guidelines, people kind of got a little esoteric, kind of went off the deep end, started doing some crazy things, but these guys have always kind of met the, the, the Snowbird uh, Society of these major organizations. And they've been using this now for like, since the 1970s as their standard uh, on pulmonary function testing. Um, it's your question? Kind of, maybe, a little bit. Okay, um, now, let's talk about the FEV1 to SVC. Here's a patient here, where that's the only ratio that's abnormal. Notice the FEV1 to FVC is normal. All the other ratios, the FEV1 to FEV6. The reason this appears on this is because this patient had lung volumes. If a patient doesn't have lung volumes, this number's absent on spirometry. There's not a blank there, it just squishes everything up so it's not there, okay? Because this patient has reduced FE to SVC, by guidelines, we still say it's obstructed. Because the FEV1, though it's below the competence of the normal, it's still above 70%, so we say it's mild obstruction still. Okay, notice now, this number, though they call it an SVC on our test, it's the same number down here in volume when they say VC, vital capacity. 
The reason it says VC instead of SVC, bite capacity, when they do put this mography, can be done in one of two ways. Sometimes they do a slow inspiratory vital capacity. Sometimes they do a slow expiratory vital capacity. It varies depending on the patient. The technician makes the call at that time, how severely impaired they are. Can they go, do they have the energy to go right into a slow IVC maneuver uh, after their expiratory effort? So they want them just to kind of take a breath first, go to full vital capacity, and then down. They make that judgment call. So it could be either inspiratory or expiratory slow vital capacity. Now, the issues of this I've already alluded to. It's in the guidelines. There are no predicted values for it, so we use the predicted values for the FE doing the, F the FEC. Uh, this is a number measured during the TLC, not spirometry. So there's some issues there. Somebody really needs to create a, a set of regression equations. The same author who does the equations for spirometry needs to also create the same one on the same patient population, but it hasn't been done. The controversial recommendation, as I said, but it's still there. It's probably going to stay there for a long time as long as they have these combined societies. Okay, um, bronchodilator response. What is a bronchodilator response? Okay, well, in this patient, we consider a positive response. We only look at the FBC and the FEV1. We don't care about the other stuff. Okay. If the FEV1 or FEC increases, changes by 12% and 200 milliliters, not or 200 milliliters, got to be both. If it improves by 12% or 200 milliliters, Either one, we call that a positive response, okay? Uh, in this particular situation, notice on this patient here, he's got obstruction, moderate for the FE1 down to 64%. Give him a bronchodilator, the FBC improves by 12%, which is 351 to 3, it's almost at, oh, 450 cc's or so. That's more than 200, so definitely that's positive, 12% there. The 14% here, well, this improves from 1.48 to 1.68, so that's 210. That's still significant, so it's positive. So let's pretend this patient, instead of improving to 1.69, only improved to 1.65 liters. Okay, that's going to be 12%, but it's not 200 milliliters. Okay, so we're not going to call that a positive response. Okay, now, let's talk about that a little bit. Where the hell do we get this? Yes. We're going to talk about that. One step ahead of me. Good. We'll hit that next. Therein lies the problem. What we're going to say. What he's talking about here is that, well, let's just talk about this another minute, and then we'll go to exactly what he's talking about because I'm going to cover that. Um, where does this come from, this 12%, 200 cc's? Let's start with there and work to the other situations. Well, it's in the guidelines, but this change comes from actually large population studies, not from intra-individual variability. If you really want to measure a response significant to the person, you really should be measuring intra-person, intra-individual variability, what that person does over time, how they change, that kind of thing, instead of big population studies. So statistically, we're probably doing it wrong, but since the guidelines recommend this as well as several other ways, it kind of has some validity. <coughs> if you want to say the word significant improvement, keep in mind you're not talking about significant statistically intra individual variability. You're talking about some large population study out there, which when I interpret these, I usually don't use the word significant. I know you guys do a lot, and that's okay, but just remember use the word significant it's because you think this is a significant change, not as a statistically significant type of thing. Okay? Now, there have been some recent studies, one that was in chess just not too long ago, I wish I actually put the date down on here and I forgot to, but they found that intra-individual variability, probably 6% and 100 cc's is significant. It takes into account what you're saying from that standpoint. Um, it's probably a little more accurate number, but even better yet, this a neat study was in, in chess in October 2015. This guy named Ward, he hypothesized, well, What's a good endpoint? You know, su survival. That's always a good endpoint. You know, you love those Kaplan Meyer curves. You know, if they more people are alive, that's a significant number. Well, he said, well, let's look at survival in bronchodilator response in huge, huge databases. And he found that if you had, and he also hypothesized, well, it makes more sense getting back to what you're saying because people are different sizes. You got little ladies five feet tall. You got big guys six foot five. 
An absolute number doesn't mean anything, you know. 500 cc's is half this little lady's volume. 500 cc's is like nothing for the six foot five guy. That's why we have the combination of 12% and 200 milliliters. Take into account big or small. Kind of throws a little bit of both in there. Okay. Might make more sense to look at change as a, per as a percent change as compared to that patient's percent predicted. And he found, in other words, an 8% change in a little five foot tall woman is gonna mean the same as an 8% change in a six foot five guy because he's got a bigger lung volume, obviously bigger change is gonna you know, take a bigger change to be the same degree as a little tiny lady. Looking at survival, they found that an FEV1 bronchodilator response of only 8% as a percent predicted correlated with increased survival. I thought that was kind of neat, actually. Are these in COPD or asthma? What's that? Are these COPD or asthma? Well, obviously, since you're looking at survival, it's got to be kind of older people that are going to die off on you. You know, you, you don't want to have like a bunch of 20-year-olds that are going to live for 80 years even if they have asthma. So kind of what they did was, this, inherently, this has got to be a COPD population. More than there's got to be an older group of population studying them. People in these labs do thousands of tests, have a large older population, look at the ones that have bronchodilators. A lot of labs, PFT labs, routinely do bronchodilator studies in every patient automatically. Because that we don't do that, we don't have the time, we don't have the personnel, we do too many tests a day. We you know, we kind of forego that. We're probably wrong doing that. Uh, a lot of the more recent studies that come out with COPD insist you use strictly post bronchodilator data in your initial baseline population. I've got issues with that also, but that's a whole other lecture. We'll talk about that. Um, but anyway, um, older population have to be COPDers, basically. You know, be the, have a, a, a death incidence that you can actually record and stuff. So, uh, but they found that 8% was highly significant, 8% of the predicted number. In other words, if that patient changes by 8% of what their percent predicted is, that correlates with survival. So that's kind of a neat number to do that. So there's multiple ways of doing this. Right now, the guidelines, what they tell us what to do, we're going to stick with that. But when you read the PFTs, the example Rodeo is bringing up is really important because you have a patient, our typical, what Dr. Jennings calls our anaerobes, you know, they have an FD1 of a half liter. You give that patient a bronchodilator. He's now got 600, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 0.6 liters. You've only approved him 100 cc's, but that's 20% to this guy. I can guarantee you that guy feels it, okay? He feels better, that extra 20%. And a little bit goes a long way in those guys, but we don't call that significant. So when you read these tests on your own patients, you know, we have, really you should only be reading patients that you know to read the record to do that. And that's not realistic here. We're doing 40 tests a day on the rotation. But you gotta take all that information into account. That's what the guidelines tell you. So everything you do, take in a clinical context and interpret it that way. Okay, um, now let's take a little another uh, situation here. We're gonna run out of time before we get the volumes. It's gonna be any spirometry today. We want volumes diffusion, we'll do that another time. Got a lot of stuff to cover here. Okay. Um, this patient here, notice they've got obstruction. Ratio's reduced. The FEV1 is 47% of predicted. Technically, you call this severe obstruction. However, notice the FEC is also reduced, 68% of predicted. Now you got a problem. Is this patient pure obstruction? Is this patient combined obstruction and restriction? Could be either. Okay, we know the patients that have bad obstruction will also um, have a lot of air traffic, which decreases their FVC. Got to take that into account. Okay, so that's where lung volumes become useful. Okay, body plethysmography. We'll talk about that first. Okay, take a patient, you lock them in a phone booth. Not going to go through all the physics here. Hopefully, you guys, sometime in your three years, will sit down with a textbook like Murray Nadal and sit there with a pencil and paper and go back to your physiology from medical school and college and actually calculate how we do that. Because it really, it's kind of neat to go through the calculations, the physics behind this and the chemistry, how you actually calculate it. But bottom line is, we do lung volumes. We're only looking, the most important numbers are the TLC. The total lung capacity tells us the hyperinflation or restriction. The RV, we also use for hyperinflation. And the RV-TLC ratio, we look for air traffic. Those are the three numbers we key on. The other numbers are using the calculations. Notice I put a little red circle about the PL there. That means this was a plethysmography volume. Some patients get claustrophobic. You just can't get them in that phone booth. They just don't do a very good job. They can't follow the instructions. And then it will say N2. The text will then default to the nitrogen and do it that way. So keep in mind, nitrogen's not as accurate as plethys as far as for air trapping and COPDers. You see a lot that many, many, the same patients, you test both ways. 
the bad COPD -er will have a normal TLC, whereas if you do it by pleth instead of nitrogen, it'll be hyperinflation on that. So you miss air trapping with nitrogen. Okay, now here's the problem with this test. We only have Caucasian predictance with confidence intervals. That comes from 200 Caucasian Mormons in Salt Lake City in 1971. However, the guidelines tell us you should adjust the predicted values by, when you don't have other races, which we don't, okay, you adjust the predicted values by a percent to adjust for the race. For example, blacks, we adjust the volumes down by 12%. But here's the problem. The guidelines don't tell us what to do for a confidence interval. They do tell us don't use percent predicted to interpret, but we've just basically raped the confidence interval by taking down the TLC by 12%. Now what do we do with the confidence interval? Okay, they just very nicely completely omit that information and kind of go on to the next topic after that. Somebody's got to address that. Okay, well, what do we do? Well, when these guidelines came out, I'm just kind of shaking my head, almost wanting to cry. Hope I hope they had some resolution to this. So I get on the phone and talk to a lot of the other guys on the West Coast, you know, like the Wassermans and the guys, Alan Morse at Salt Lake City, no relation. The other Morse up Oregon, also no relation. But, you know, God, what do you guys do out there? A lot of Morses in this field for some reason. <laughs> Don't know why. But, uh, anyway, so what we, they all said, what we kind of all agreed to do, if we scale down by 12%, the TLC predicted for blacks, Asians, this kind of thing, well, we'll scale the confidence interval down by 12% also. Well, that really makes a lot of mathematical sense, doesn't it? <laughs> Statistically, okay. Now, here's one of the inherent flaws, but it kind of somewhat makes sense, but here's where it kind of loses its making the sense. We know from spirometry that the confidence intervals for blacks are larger than for, cauca from con for Caucasians. Remember, they're 10 and a half for the FEV and the FBC, and they're 9 and a half for, for whites? Wow, okay, well, why is that? You know, okay, you can speculate a lot of reasons on that, and uh, one of the funnier ones, one of, one of the fellows one year said, well, maybe you just, you know, I'm here in Detroit, it's a culture thing, maybe you just can't do the tests as well. No, that's not it. You know, the data, NHANES database had, you know, 15,000 blacks in it. What's probably happened is, unlike the Caucasian population or white population, pretty much all of European extract, one central area of Europe, very homogeneous population. As opposed to the black population, that's not, that's not a race. Black population has many races. Than, like after all the way from Pygmies to Watusis. They all have anthropomorphic features that are different. When they come to this country, we've taken like 100 countries at that time, merged them into one, call them one thing. Of course they're gonna have wider confidence intervals. That's a more non-homogeneous population. It's a, it's a very varied population in size, anthropomorphic features. So their confidence intervals are gonna be much bigger just from the scatter on that. Okay, um, so that's one of the inherent flaws. Now, um, TLC efforts are subject to more error than uh, FBC efforts, which we'll show why in a minute here. Uh, we have good predicted values for all different races, blacks, Hispanics, Caucasians. So if I have a patient that has a normal FBC based on good racial predicted equations, because of the way we kind of distort the TLC, if that TLC is low, I'm not going to say that patient's restricted. Okay, let's go through that a little bit more here in a second. Uh, now one of the problems also with TLC is the confidence intervals do not vary with age or height. They stay constant. So in other words, the confidence interval is 1.6 liters on a TLC, whether you're a five foot tall male or six foot five male, okay? Now why is that a problem? Well, if you're a five foot tall male, the confidence interval of 1.6 liters is like a third of your total TLC. In other words, your bottom limit of normal is down around 60 some percent of predicted. Okay, now. Why is the TL, we're going to talk about this a little more in a minute or so, but why do I say the TLC is not a gold standard? Well, we have to understand where we get the TLC. Okay, when we actually do plethysmography, what are we measuring? And don't say TLC. What's the actual number we're measuring? Anybody? You mentioned, right, we're measuring the functional residual capacity. We're measuring that FRC by that panting maneuver. So we measure the FRC that's right here, FRC plethysmography. And then, what we do is we have the patient completely blow out after we open that closed valve. We have them blow down the residual volume. And then we figure out what that expiratory reserve volume you blew out, and we subtract that from the FRC, but now we get to the RV over here. Subtract this guy and get to here. And then, after the RV, we either have that patient go into slow inspiratory vital capacity, or take a break, go to full vital capacity, blow it out, and we measure that vital capacity. And then we take that vital capacity, 
than we added on to the RV that we got by subtracting the ERV that we got from subtracting from the FRCs type thing. Come on, there's a lot of measurements in there, okay? A lot of room for error, starting right from the original panting maneuver. And then, if the patient's a non-white, then what we do is we then start adjusting by 12% on the, on the predicted value and then do that with a confidence interval. How can we possibly make that a gold standard of a measurement? So that's why if we have a normal FVC based on a racial equation and this is reduced, I'm just going to identify there's a discrepancy here instead of calling the patient restricted. I do not think this is a gold standard. I think it's a, a lot of people will tell you, oh, Pleth is the gold standard. I think at best it's a bronze standard. Okay. So anyway, um, so in other words, if we see a TLC that's low, that any vital capacity is normal, whether it's the SVC, FVC, or dilator FVC, restriction will not be reported. We'll put a qualifying statement pointing out the discrepancy. For example, what it's going to say is, this is a normal spirogram, though the total lung capacity is low, restriction is not reported because the force vital capacity is normal. That's what we're going to see in those particular situations. Okay, now, they also recommend using the RV, residual volume, to diagnose hyperinflation. Makes sense because the first thing that pathologically goes wrong in COPD is the air trapping and the RV starts to go up, the residual volume. There's very good confidence intervals for these residual volume. All you have to do is subtract the ERV off the FRC. So it here at least probably going to be more accurate just because there's less steps involved in it. And as I said, we have good confidence intervals for that and the RV TLC. But again, we only have Caucasian predicteds, so we have to do all the same little you know, gymnastic maneuvers on those. Those are like 7% changes instead. Okay, a couple examples here. Uh, patient here, spirogram, he's got obstruction. And even though he's given a bronchodilator and improves, his FVC is still reduced 79%, it's in red. So this patient looks like restriction based on the FVC. Based on the dilator FVC, it's still in red. Based on the slow vital capacity, it's still in red, really reduced. So now this patient has obstruction, we do a plethysmography. We find out this patient has a normal TLC. He doesn't have restriction. So now we can clearly state this patient has severe obstruction, not obstruction with a severely reduced FEV1. That's clearly all due to the obstruction. We look down a little bit lower and we see the RV, clearly that's almost twice normal, hyperinflation. The RV TLC is really huge, indicates hyperinflation. Oh, I'm sorry, air traffic. Restriction, opposite phenomena, everything's reduced. The FVC is only 28% of predicted, a patient that has an NSIP. TLC is only 31% of predicted, RV is really low. Everything's low, everything's low. Clearly we got restriction. Now, where I want to end up the last five minutes, we're not going to get to diffusion today, that's a whole other complicated topic, but a couple points I wanted to make, because this pops up on the boards every now and then also. Um, remember how we mentioned that the total lung capacity, the lower limit of normal, stays constant your entire age. From the age of 20 up to 100, these are the lower limits. In red are males, I'm sorry, in red are females, in blue are males. The di three different lines for each uh, sex are because they're different sizes. The lower limit of normal up here for a, as a percent predicted, the lower confidence of the normal in a 72 inch tall male is going to be like 83% of predicted. Go below 83%, he's going to be in the abnormal range. By the time you get down to a uh, male that's only uh, five feet tall, it's around 76% of predicted. But it stays constant as they get older. Females are shifted downward a little bit. Uh, uh, I said that opposite, I'm sorry. These are females of that size, the red. Males are a little bit lower, they're uh, uh, lower limits of normal. Now remember now, I showed you before that the FVC lower limit of normal, it's not a straight line, it falls as you age. Let's play some little games mathematically here with this. Okay, question first though is, why does this happen? Why does your TLC stay the same your entire life? We know your force vital capacity falls as you get older. Predictants keep going down linearly as you get older. Well, the reason for that is because this is the, uh, what a predicted TLC is. This is in a female 66 inches tall. This is her TLC for entire life here. From 20 to 100, her chest never changes. She might get osteoporosis or get swollen, but if she stays healthy, good spine, not collapsing on itself, it's going to stay the same her entire life. Now, what does happen is as the force vital capacity is declining, her predicted value, the RV residual volume is going up the same amount and they cancel each other out, basically. Why is that happening? Well, as you get older, you lose your elastic recoil of the lungs. The lungs become more floppy. That's why the residual volume starts to rise. 
you can't push as much air out, so the residual volume rises as you get older because the FEC goes down. That's often a board physiology question. Remember that. They ask you why that happens. Okay. A couple board questions today. Okay, so let's kind of just kind of show here what one of the things that we're going to do on our reports is let's get back to this original one here. These are the lower limits of normal of a female. Uh, 72 inches high from the age of 20 to up to 100. If uh, they're 66 inches and if they're 60 inches tall. The lower limits of normal are always going to be about 75% based on TLC. But if you're short and you're tall, if you're a female. Okay, this is the white female lower limit of normal as a percent predicted. Notice how superimposing on here, but as they get older, the lower limits will keep falling. If you throw the black females on here, they're even shifted even lower. What I want to show you here is that if a patient has a normal force vital capacity, it's in black. But if it's below 75% of predicted, which it might be in many of these down in here, that's why I put that blue line at 75%. What the report is going to tell you, it's going to add a phrase, it's going to call it normal, but it's going to report that saying, recommend maybe you should check lung volumes. Because those confidence limits are so wide in older people that if they have a TCL up in this range, you know, above that area, it's probably not, you know, I'm sorry, if they have a low TLC, you might have to think that patient really is restricted. Okay, even though because the confidence limits are so, look how wide they are. And a black female, when you're 80 years of age, you can be 65% of predicted and still have a normal FBC. Diffusion, not going to talk a lot about right now, but it follows the same principles as everything else. Everything causes diffusion to go down. Everything. Emphysema, VQ mismatching, ILD, thickening of alveolar membrane, destruction of lung destroying, VQ mismatching, shunts, anemia, carboxy hemoglobin, everything makes diffusion abnormal. Everything. Uh, very sensitive number, but very nonspecific. Okay, the point to take home on this, the lower limits are normally even worse than they are for the FVC and everything else. If you use that 80% cutoff for diffusion of predicted, all these people, these are basically different uh, males and females with a lower limit of normal is for different sizes. Look at this whole area in here that we could put in gray in here. These are all people that are below 80% but are still normal. So diffusion can be down to 60% of predicted. On that, that's the point I wanted to make. We adjust diffusion by 7% instead of 12% for the different reasons. And I had a bunch of examples, but we're not going to talk about those right now. We'll end it. All right? All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Oh, I'll let you take care of that stuff. Thank you. I forgot to press the start button. Oh,